How's it going, everyone? Today, I interview Phil Rowley from FlightCraftAngling.com, where we talk about indicators, chronomid behavior, special retrieves, and a bunch of other great content, including Phil's top lake patterns. You don't want to miss out as Phil breaks down all of these lake fishing tips today. Just listen to the first 10 minutes, and if you don't find a huge tip, I will give you your money back today. So, without further ado, here's Phil from FlycraftAngling.com. How's it going, Phil? It's going good. Awesome. It's going good. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I wanted to jump in here. Um, you know, I know you are known as a still water fishing expert, uh, fly tying, uh, you know, guru kind of, I'm sure you've got a lot more, uh, kind of, uh, accolades and all that stuff, but, um, I, I was just going to jump in here and maybe just kind of ask you a, a number of questions and dig into a few things. I hope to provide some value to those listening. Does that sound good? Sounds like a plan, dude. All right. All right. Good deal. Um, so maybe you could start off just tell us a little bit about, you know, how you got it as far as the fly fishing world, you know, how you got to where you are now and how you got started. Uh, maybe just bring us back quickly and take us back to where you are today. Wow. Long way ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, started fishing. I was born in England, so I started oh, wow. fishing when I think I was about five years old and, and course fishing, you know, pike, uh, not pike, so, well, not, I guess they're there, but more carp and rud and those kind of um, fish in, in local ponds, fishing with maggots and things like that. It's just vague memories. Emigrated to Canada when I was seven and grew up in British Columbia, primarily on Vancouver Island, um, where just fished. There was some local lakes we fished there, mostly with conventional tackle. And of course, it's surrounded by ocean, so you dabbled a bit along the shoreline there. Right. And it wasn't until late teens, early 20s, I got into the fly fishing aspect. And in British Columbia, where I spent the majority of my life, I now live in Alberta. I've been here for the last 13 years or so, 12, okay. 13 years. Um, rich still water culture there. Obviously, the salmon and steelhead as well. Um, but uh, for um, the average person, still water fishing was probably the most accessible. Um and uh, so spent a lot of time on that and just sort of fell in love with it. And particularly with fly fishing, the whole match the hatch and mm -hmm. really getting to know um, why fish did what they did and what they ate and why they ate them and when they ate them, all those kind of things. When I conventional fished in my youth, I wasn't much, you know, you just put this on or that on and somebody said it was good or you hope for the best. So mm -hmm. um, ironically, it was my wife and I were just either dating or just early in our marriage, we... Um, we're up fishing a lake, Cameron Lake on Vancouver Island, which is known for brown trout. And I've been, <clears throat> you know, sort of dragging around all the conventional stuff. And I remember one evening, uh, the trout would come up to the surface and rise close to the camp. And this guy walked out, uh, sort of, he almost looked like, I want to say Roderick A. Brown. <laughs> he had the wicker creel and a nice. fly rod. And we'd been struggling for the better part of a week. And he went down there in about an hour or so and said, didn't say anything, just sort of appeared out of the gloom and caught his three or four fish and left. And <laughs> I'd been like, hmm, what's going on here? <laughs> so the, fuel, the, the fuse was lit. I had a friend who had been pestering me to learn how to fly fish and got me out on a lawn and and uh, started flailing and then took me to a uh, river west of Vancouver where I was living now uh, on the west coast and um, took me fly fishing, caught a trout on my first time out and was cool. just consumed after that by, you know, I'd, I'd never felt anything on a fishing rod fight like that because on a dry fly, there's nothing to encumber your, your contact with the fish. So right. it was just, I'm hooked forever. I don't think I've read another book book probably 10 books since that time that weren't fly fishing related <laughs> there you go just off the deep end and gone <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah awesome never to never to return that's great never to return yeah. cool cool so Love. and now you're uh, pretty much speaking around the country and uh, doing seminars and kind of covering everything right yeah, it kind of evolved from that. I, uh, you know, joined a fly fishing club, learned how to tie flies, just sort of went out and fished whenever I could to try and figure it all out. And I joke, you never really figure it out. I think that's the motto of my website is because you never stop learning. Every right. day on the water, you learn, you're learning something new, and that's part of the appeal of it all. It's mm -hmm. it just your appetite's never quenched. 
and uh, <clears throat> so that sort of evolved. I started writing news, you know, items for the newsletter, the club. I had a concept for a book uh, that turned into fly patterns for still waters because when I started out lake fishing, there wasn't too much in flies directly targeted at lakes that you could find. You know, there were certainly fly patterns out there, but they were um, all over the place or just scattered, scattered through local knowledge. So yeah. that book um, did quite well. It's still going strong. Um, and then um, since that time, what have we done? I've written a couple of other books. Um, working on another one that seems to take forever and ever. With the advent of the internet, there's hmm. a lot of different ways to do. Um, established a good friendship. I've uh, been friends many, many years with Brian Chan. We do a lot of stuff mm -hmm. together. We have a online fly fishing store that caters to Stillwater, uh, the challenges of Stillwaters with flies and indicators and all those Stillwater-specific mm -hmm. tools. We're planning on going through a big, a bit of an expansion um, on that this coming year, uh, working on a Stillwater fly, a Stillwater fly fishing app that hmm. crunching like mad to get all those tasks done. I do schools with Brian on and off. And as you said, I speak all over North America, fly fishing shows and things like that. I just like, uh, interacting with people, hearing of their, uh, challenges and their successes and, and learning a lot from those discussions with them. Right. And, yeah. and of course, while you're traveling, you get to fish, <laughs> Yep. <laughs> <laughs> which is always a benefit too. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. No, that, that's awesome. That's, uh, the matching the hatch thing. I, you know, think a lot of, a lot of the people I talk to, you know, I, I covered, uh, steelhead fishing as well as kind of <laughs> being inner fly fishing. And I haven't really got into a, a lot on lake fishing. That's why I was so excited to touch base with you here because i know there's a lot of questions out there for people and you know matching the hatch is, is a big one whether you're on rivers or lakes but you know yeah. that, that can be you can pull your hair out not not being able to catch those fish when they're rising in front of you um, yeah or you just coronamids are probably the biggest one because yeah. they're you know for such a, a simple looking insect and as far as the flies when you look at them aren't terribly complex either but they can drive you to fits of rage almost some days yeah. trying to figure them out but it's just a you just got to invest the time and and for me the big thing was actually believing a fish you know early in my still water development that a fish would find a little size 14 or 16 black thread body mm -hmm. fly in all that water you just couldn't believe you know you want to throw on something the size of a Yep. small car <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah they have um, good they have so good they eyesight find, <laughs> but they make their living eating the small stuff and once you get that first one and sort of get confidence in the method it becomes kind of all consuming and that's again mother projects brian and i did the conquering chronomids dvd combo we've got mm -hmm. out now and that's been very successful as well just trying to you know pass along our uh, sort of trials and errors onto others so that shorten their learning curve and have greater enjoyment on the water. Yeah, yeah, no, and that's uh, basically the whole idea with this, you know, this interview, that the show I have here is that, you know, this is just a different form, you know, different format of the same thing, you know, I mean, talking to you, you're going to put out a bunch of information today and it'll, and it's going to live online for a long time. So, you know, I'm yeah. sure people will come across this and be able to connect with you. So that's a good, um, I was going to ask you, as far as just some general tips, I know you fish for a lot of different species, um, but do you have, you know, for maybe somebody getting into lake fishing, um, kind of a beginner type, as far as kind of just general lake fishing tips or anything you might throw out to somebody new to it? Um, yeah, it's, well, first of all, try not to get, the one thing about, I think a lot of people have with lakes is when they first get to that lake shore and look out there and just see that vast, flat expanse of water, it's, it's not as, um, you know, it doesn't have the boundaries that a small river or stream would. You know, you can see the other side. In some cases, you can wade across it. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see how the current seams are different and rocks and, and sort of get an idea. If you were a fish and didn't want to stay in the current, where would you hide? Um, it's not always that easy on lakes. But, um, you know, just invest the time and try to break it down into small chunks, you mm -hmm. know, fish at bay, fish. And, and look for, we have the same structure. So I look for any kind of changes so that can be a change in depth a change in bottom contour a point a drop off those kind of things any okay. kind of little hump or change that's going to attract fish as opposed to just a big flat basin there are times they'll certainly feed out there but you know so most of the time you're spending working water 20 feet deep or less mm -hmm. um, because that's where the majority of the food sources live. You get sunlight penetration, which on productive lakes stimulates plant growth, which provides habitat for all the different 
bugs, invertebrates, bait mm. fish that trout feed on. That's the supermarket. So the logic is if you park out in front of it, somebody's going to come in <laughs> and get something to eat. Yeah. Uh, and just work those work those areas thoroughly. And, and um, depth is probably the biggest key. So your um, trout are, tend to be <clears throat> pretty opportunistic on what they feed. Of course, if there's some concentration of food, they'll certainly turn their attention to that. Um, but a lot of times they're just cruising... Um, just above the bottom, that's where the food is. Um, we don't get the dry fly fishing um, that rivers and streams are, are uh, famous for, mm-hmm. which I guess is a bit of a, I do like catching fish on dries, but uh, um, for the most part, you're going to be working, trying to keep your flies, you know, close to the bottom region and around weed beds and places where fish would hang out. It's, I call it the, you know, remember the movie, The Field of Dreams, if you build yep. it, they will come. Well, if you find it, they will come. So, yeah. um, you know, and you, and you work it through and, and you just, um, you don't want to sit there all day, but you want to move around a little bit too. Usually if you're, I find if there's fish in the neighborhood and you make a proper presentation, you'll probably get some kind of positive response in 15 to 30 minutes. So if you're not catching mm-hmm. fish, a lot of times it's not that you're doing necessarily anything wrong. It's just nobody there. Yeah. So move around. Unless, of course, that most frustrating of experiences when everybody else is catching and you're not. Yeah. yeah. You. But, uh, you know, you're looking for hatching insects. Um, investing time as you're getting prepared on the shore is a big help. So look in the you know, the long, you know, the shoreline grasses and, and vegetation for insects like dragonflies and damselflies that crawl out of the water to emerge. Look in spider webs if they're around, they catch all kinds of things, you know, mm-hmm. see what's flying around. Look where concentrations of birds like swallows are because they feed on emerging insects as they're flying away. All so right. much like a ocean going fly fisher uses, you know, herring, you know, gulls and seabirds like that to find bait balls. We're using it to uh, find hatches because they can be quite localized. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, those are, those are all. Keep your, don't go in there with a fixed, you know, uh, a preconceived notion. Keep your options open. Yeah. And whenever you're out there in the end of the day, make lots of notes because it's those notes, um, journals, diaries, informal, very formal, whatever you want to make of it. It's those, you'll start to see things occurring over and over again. It's your chance to sort of catalog them all down because, as you know, as we get older, our memory gets worse. Yeah. <laughs> it seems what mine does. Yeah. So, yeah, for sure. No, I was just thinking, so when you're talking about uh, kind of casting and, you know, different types of, um, I guess, stripping versus trolling and things like that, do you kind of do a little bit of everything or do you, are you mostly casting and stripping? No, and... I, my favorite way to fish a lake is from an anchored position, casting and stripping and working the fly. Um, mm-hmm. Not a big fan of trolling. Um, and that's just a personal thing. Again, I like to work the fly and, and um, yeah. Like, you know, just, yeah, it's different. It's different. not against, I'm not against trolling no. or thinking anybody's bad for doing it. It's just not something I prefer to do. So, you know, with the advent of strike indicators, that's really knocked a lot of time off of the learning curve for fly fishing lakes. Um, you know, there, I think some people oversimplify lakes and say, oh, I was just chucking a bobber out and yeah. wait for it to go under. And, and there's, I guess there's certainly that aspect to it, but there's a lot of, um, when you get into indicator fishing, there's lots of variables and things you can play with to, to make it, um, work better for you. But, um, in simple terms, an indicator allows you to control your depth and have some control over your retrieve speed because you can just chuck it out there and let it sit and do nothing, or you can retrieve it, either use a hand twist retrieve or mm-hmm. slowly pinch it in or strips or whatever, but your flies tracking at the same depth, mm-hmm. whereas other cast and retrieve methods sometimes yep. is a bit of experimentation uh, based on sync time, sync rate of the line, sync rate of your fly, uh, the effects of wind, all those kind of things that make mm-hmm. it a little more technical that way. But um, no, I fish floating lines with and without indicators, midge tips, which is a floating line with a short, clear uh, sinking section. A hover line, which I really like, sinks super, super slow, and a variety of different, uh, you know, sinking rate lines, depending mm. on this. Again, it's <laughs> we could be here for days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's lots, lots of variables. But if you break it down, if you want to take three lines out on a lake, yeah, I take a floater, and that would allow you to fish. Uh, and arguably, if I only had to fish one line, believe it or not, it probably would be a floating line because mm-hmm. a floating line allows me to fish. Uh, obviously the dry fly emerger aspect, I can fish strike indicators and I can fish long leader tactics, um, that 
we christened fishing naked where you're fishing long leaders 15 18 20 25 feet sometimes depending on water depth and just basically slowly slowly retrieving that fly line back mm. you know so slow on the retrieve the fly line mm. if the water was flat calm that day it wouldn't even make a wake mm. that's how slow you're going so you're using you know little pheasant tails uh, little prince nymphs mm -hmm. obviously this method was designed for coronamid pupa and larva fishing as well. So small little fly scuds. I fish leeches this way. Hmm. It just allows you to, con you know, you. Yeah. It's a it's a finesse te technique, but once you learn it, that take on there too is is a bit like a wet fly swing on a river. It's that little stab sometimes, mm -hmm. and it's pretty addictive. Little pull. Yeah. The other line I would have is a clear intermediate. Uh huh. Um, sinks at about one and a half to two inches per second um with lake fishing particularly with an anchor um approach you all all lakes all, all sorry all sinking lines will get to the bottom it's just a matter of time and most of the invertebrates trout feed upon in lakes are not olympic athletes they don't have mm -hmm. jetpacks on their back so they can't scoot around at 100 miles an hour so they move slowly and they move erratically they crawl they swim they dart mm -hmm. and they rest and they move and if you have a sinking line that sinks too fast because everybody sees oh i'm in 15 feet of water therefore i need something you right. know it gets down six, seven inches per second um hmm. it's not, not a race good. to the bottom no. your flies lying on the bottom you can't go slow enough before you're hanging up so it's <laughs> better to wait uh and let the fly sink now if you're trolling or drifting a tech and a european style technique known as lock style it's getting more and more popular it's a hmm. great way to cover water um, but you're still casting and retrieving. You use a, in lock style fishing, you're using a, a drogue, which is like a sea anchor, a big underwater parachute that right. slows and controls your drift. Mm -hmm. You still, you, that is deployed upwind. And when you position it on the boat, it stops the boat from swaying and controls the drift. So you're not spinning around and, uh, you're still casting downstream, hmm. right. And retrieving the fly. But because as soon as your fly and line cast, you're kind of moving onto it, you've got to have a little bit of an accelerated sink rate. So you just don't run over everything before it gets down. Hmm. And that varies on your drift speed. You know, um, yeah. if fish are active, then you can go with a little faster sink rate line because it means you can pull the fly through the water faster and the fish being active are more likely to chase it. You know, you, that's sort of the way it right. goes. So the, the third line is typically something that does sink fast, maybe like a type five that sinks at five inches per second or even a three, uh, <clears> some <throat> like a six. It's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a latitude on that last um, sinking line to choose from. But again, that allows you to fish deeper, fish faster, and you can also fish vertically with it. We do this with chironomids, uh, fishing vertically anchored in water. Well, you can do it as shallow as 14, 15 feet, but generally it's a method we do in 18, 20, 25 feet and mm -hmm. cast straight down and let the fly hang just above the bottom and then slowly retrieve it up. And mm -hmm. boy, they they pulverize the mm -hmm. fly with, with that. It's, with, it's scary. Yeah, <laughs> with a similar it. sort of retrieve, just using different retrieve type methods. Yeah, very, very slowly usually. Yeah. We call it dangling. Uh -huh. um, and I use it fishing for walleye in some of our local, we have a mixture of lakes where I'm in Alberta with trout and uh, other, and then lakes that are more walleye pike focused and you know the the walleye fishermen with their gear you know jigs and stuff kind of look at me pulling up with a fly rod but uh, fly yeah. rods are very it's, they're not a they're not going to take you into your backing like a trout or anything like that but it's, it's sort of a forbidden fruit thing <laughs> it's yeah just, you're not supposed to catch these with a fly rod and then you're <laughs> proving everybody wrong it's it's kind of fun and in the warm summer months when they're still chaseable and it's too hot for you know, um, for trout fishing, it's too hard on them to, you know, A, they go off the bite, and B, if you catch one, you're not going to do it much good. Um, mm -hmm. It's a great alternative. So those are sort of the three lines, again, summary yeah. would be a, the floating line, the clear intermediate, and that fast sinker, say a type five. And then fly lines are a bit like golf clubs. Then you start filling in the blanks, Yeah. right? Yeah. So, again, you get all the other ones. And uh, <clears throat> I guess when you get really into this, I joke that only the paranoid survives. So you've got everything yeah. for me when i go out i am carrying probably two or even three sink, uh, floating lines because i always have two rods rigged up mm -hmm. so i can quickly change from one to the other if something or, and it's also there's a definite lazy factor in there yeah uh, what kind of a, that, what are you you must be in a boat normally typically or some sort of yeah, like I've, a, yeah i've got uh well i've got a fair number of them actually I've yeah got a 10 foot a flat bottom boat, a John boat, often yep. called, or a pram. I got a 14 footer, and I have my 17 foot with the 40 horse on the back and the pedestal seats. And 
the comfort. <laughs> yeah. So you don't do any of the, I guess I the, do, the, the I, float tubing type of stuff. No, I still do. I yeah. started, you know, for years I used to float tube a lot because, uh, you could deflate them, throw them in the trunk of a car. And where mm-hmm. we lived in Vancouver, the Coquihalla highway, uh, put cam loops within a two and a half, th- cam loops merit area and within a two and a half, three hour drive. So you could day trip. Yeah. Um, but, and then to save gas, you all pile into a Honda civic and yep. throw everything in the back <laughs> off you go. Um, but I also have um, Outcast Pack 9000, and I've got a new Stealth as well um, that I like to use um, too. But I do a lot of guiding in schools now, so I tend to use my big boat uh, and use an electric motor to get around most of the time. And mm-hmm. I can get two people with me comfortably, safely, um, you know, and fish out of a very stable platform. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so, yeah, definitely uh, you cover the lines. I was thinking as far as a rod, are there any special things when you think about the, the rod you want to get and weights? And, I mean, I guess when I, we're getting into this, I'm always thinking of trout, but I know there's obviously other species we could be talking well, about here. Yeah, generally for trout, you're probably – your five and six weights um some if you're in light winds small fish a four weight would work uh conversely if you're in heavy winds heavy fish seven weight when i went down to argentina uh to chase those big rainbows on lago strobel or jurassic lake as it's known in some circles um you're using seven and eight weights because you're dealing with fish that are 15 to 20 pounds and it blows in patagonia yeah Uh, so you need you know it's just letting the tool do the job kind of philosophy um but an all-around general i you know for years i used to fish five weights when i was younger and more agile and fitter and <laughs> mm-hmm. now I let the tool do the job so i fish six weights most time i'm a big believer in long fly rods i use right now my favorite rods a mystic 10 foot three inch m series rod it's mm-hmm. kind of a moderate fast action um, but I like the long rods because, well, when you fish an indicator, it's from a simple distance between indicator and fly. You can fish yeah. greater distances, even though I use uh, the quick release indicators I, I sell and distribute. Mm-hmm. Um, it gives you the ability to steer and control fish. You can imagine from an anchored position, um, trout have that innate ability to find something to wrap around. So when you've got two anchor ropes down, electric motor, right. a transducer or a sounder, they find it. So yeah. the beauty of if a fish comes in, you know, as it's coming back close to the boat to land and it has those last minute surges, you can use that long rod to basically extend and steer it around and clear those obstacles. Um, you get great roll casts with a long rod. I'm mm-hmm. sure you can appreciate that for yep. steelhead fishing. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, you know, reach, um, the ability to it, – that moderate fast action, it's got a, so, a softer forgiving tip, so it mm-hmm. cushions strikes. Um, what yeah. else? Yeah. Men, no. We mend on lakes. What's that? You know, we, we mend on lakes. I do. Um, you know, when you're fishing floating line techniques where you've got the wind at your back when you're anchored and you cast, you want to quarter – left or right because i'm a right-handed caster i usually quarter up to the right and make a mend and just let that line sweep and drift down Mm -hmm. Um, it's a great way to cover water with a static or near static presentation so mending helps because you don't want a big c to form in your line you want to be you know got to be um tight to your fly when you're fishing lakes because they can inhale and spit in Mm -hmm. a blink of an eye if you've got any kind of slack in your system you're going to miss fish right so um all of those things come in. You can certainly fish with an eight and a half, nine foot, but most of the serious still water fishermen I know are minimum nine and a half, ten, and, and in Europe even eleven foot. Hmm. Eleven. I had a question today about using switch rods, eleven yeah. foot, three inch rod. Yeah, I was just going right? to say, is that something people are getting into the switch rods for lakes? Um, more for the length, not for the. Um, you know, you don't want to be using sort of spay casting techniques a lot of times on lakes just for surface disturbance. Yeah. Um, but the length and all the attributes, if the rod isn't heavy in the hand and all that stuff, uh, there's no reason why not. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, the technology is get, <laughs> it's so good these days. It's for a lot. For, well, I don't think you can buy a bad rod yeah, that, for the most part. Exactly. Right? Yeah. It that's the crazy. The personal preference and budget. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. <laughs> I, I definitely love my, uh, my 10 foot rod for sure. Yeah. yeah. That, that's great. Um, so the, the chromie is, uh, you, you want to talk a little about the chromie and maybe some other patterns that you've, um, you know, you've developed over the years. I'm known for, yeah. yeah. Um, the chromie came about, um, when I started chronomet fishing, most of your patterns were, you know, somber colors, blacks and browns and greens with mm-hmm. a little bit of, you know, wire or, um, <clears throat> tinsel wraps. 
And it wasn't until the advent of the throat pump getting more and more popular where we actually sample um, the throat area, the esophagus, where the fish is just eaten. And, and when you um, carefully take those out and put them in a vial or a jar and look at them, a lot of insects, and particularly coronamid pupa, use they trap gases beneath their um, pupal skin because basically that pupal skin is like a little bag the adult oh, yeah. sitting in. So there's a there's a separation process going on between the adult inside and the skin of that pupa, and that creates space and the insects able to trap gases in there that aid in buoyancy. And then when the split forms at the surface, that kind of expulsion of gas I think helps fire the adult into our world. Hmm. Those gases make the pupa look very shiny and mirror-like, mm -hmm. and the more advanced they get in their pupil states, the shinier and shinier they become. Uh, Gary LaFontaine first talked about that in his book, Caddis Flies, when he was using um, Antron and Sparkle Yarn right. to create that with caddis pupa. Mayfly nymphs, uh, Calabatus do it. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of insects do that. So that when we started looking at live wiggling pupa that had just been in, you know, the trout had just fed upon, we're like, our flies are pretty dull and somber because most of our fly pattern development prior to that came from you kept a fish for dinner and you looked inside of it, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, all the lifelike qualities are gone. So it started, you know, developing, looking for, I'm going to tie a fly with a silver body and a red rib because a lot of, the reason for the red rib is a lot of chironomid species retain hemoglobin from the larval states. That's what gives the larva that blood red coloration. Mm. It allows them to survive in oxygen poor conditions near the bottom where there's lots of decomposition or in warm temperatures where there's less oxygen in the mm. water. So that's still hangs around so it accumulates at the tip of the abdomen sometimes and what we call red butt pupa and up the abdominal segments so that's where the red comes in and i got to admit the first time you throw that fly out because nobody else is fishing with that you're like what am i doing right this <laughs> is crazy and then all of a sudden the indicator goes down and you get a tug and that fly has now it started as a silver body still use a silver flashaboo mm -hmm. uh, for the body it used to have a wire rib with the advent of holographic mylars that sort of replaced the wire rib but now we do it in the silver flashaboo bodies i do it in one the the flashaboo color code is 6916. I think it's called blue steel. Hmm. It's like a pewter gunmetal gray coloration right. because when when the coronamid's at depth and it's got a little water pressure on it, I don't think the gases can expand as much as they can as they get near the surface. And it takes a while. It's not this light switch kind of process. It just sort of accumulates, accumulates, accumulates. And the pupa is getting, starts dark and then it gets progressively shinier. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So in that from dark to super shiny bit, there's a kind of a stage where they're a gunmetal gray. And um, we use that material, anti-static bags that um, um, circuit boards and things like that are popular to use too, but they're not always easy to find. you got to cut them into strips. They're not as forgiving in the hand as Flashaboo. If, if you're a little heavy handed, they tear and they rip. Um, so we use those for the bodies. And then with, like I said earlier, the holographic mylars, we're using red ribs, green ribs, orange ribs, brown ribs, black ribs, mm -hmm. purple ribs. So the chromie, you could fill up <laughs> yeah. it has evolved into this um, fly pattern for such a simple thing. You think changing a rib color can make all the difference in the world some days. It can. It's just a head scratcher. Everybody yeah. asks me, oh, it's what they want. Yeah. <laughs> so first rule, give them what they want. Yeah. Right? So <laughs> we can argue about it later. Um, okay. So that's how that fly has evolved. And that kind of theory has gone into other flies. I've got one called the Collaborator, which is another coronamid pupa that's kind of a burnt orange or summer duck coloration. That fly um, started, its genesis was over breakfast one morning on a lake in British Columbia called White Lake. There was a species of coronamids that came off there and other lakes in that area and probably around North America called the, nicknamed the carrot because it looks like an orangey carrot coloration. And... Um, we were having some success, but not enough. So we were mucking around with materials and came across summer duck frostbite, which is a woven material. Now there's other substitutes you can use, like uh, uh, an English material called buzzer wrap that's gaining popularity over here for coronamids. And that sort of burnt orange coloration has just worked for me everywhere, like in California, Oregon, mm -hmm. oh, everywhere, everywhere, Western Canada, Western United States. So it's become a staple pattern of mine um lots of other things um balanced leeches i've 
popularized. I didn't invent the balance leech. Mm -hmm. um, that was actually designed by um, a friend of mine in Spokane, Jerry McBride, who realized that when you hang flies under an indicator that they don't always hang with the correct posture. They hang vertically and most, particularly leeches, move through the water horizontally. So he figured out to use a small or a section of a pin with a tungsten bead where you lash that pin and bead assembly onto the shank so it's stuck out in front of the hook eye and would tip the hook horizontal. Yep. Right. And my contribution to that process was using small up eye jig hooks because if you're not careful, uh, when you tie on a standard down eye hook, you get kind of involved with tying the fly and you forget about the hook eye and totally obscure it. I always joke oh. those are the ones you give away to friends. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> accuse you of never giving you any flies. Um, the jig hook simply, when the fly's done, it sticks up above um, the body so you can tie the thing on. It's just a practical application. Mm. And it used to be we could only get those jig hooks in number 10s, but with the popularity of Euro, Euro nymphing oh, yeah. and those small big hooks you know i was catching huge rainbows down in argentina on size 16 little balanced micro leeches mm. and so that fly is um really popular tight in a variety of sizes it's not just an indicator fly i spent a lot of time saying it's not an indicator fly it certainly works wonders under there but it's also a great cast and strip fly because mm. you can imagine from jig hook it hops through oh, yeah. the water a jig which is arguably the most effective lure yep. ever made and it's great for bait fish leeches dragonfly nymphs like we tie with the as soon as we had the access to more different sizes of jig hooks now all of a sudden anything was possible hmm. all right damsels mayflies you could balance anything right right yeah um, so it's it's had a real and i use them nymphing on rivers like i like to euro nymph a lot as well and um it's a great fly to nymph on a river particularly just after runoff when everything's been scoured up and you've got crane fly larvae and leeches and all kinds of things tumbling downstream and mm -hmm. leeches are just a good and it's a good streamer pattern to cast and strip too because it pops and jigs right mm -hmm. so. nice nice wow that's yeah those are awesome tips um what's the um just thinking about i guess changing here a little bit on uh thinking about more specifically to fly tying um, mm -hmm. I, I guess you've you've definitely tied up a number of different patterns do you have any um you know i get a couple of common questions from a lot of people that are getting started and struggling a little bit and one of them is tying small flies and like proportions do you do you, do you have anything that might a tip that might help somebody that's struggling i, I mean i guess I, I don't know anything that sticks out to you well the first thing that popped into my mind when i was it was ironic because i, I am noted for for fly tying as well and mm -hmm. I, when i first started fly fishing i was kind of like i don't know if i want to learn how to tie flies well like <laughs> That kind of went out the window. Yeah. Um, and um, I started after I got reasonably proficient. I had the local fly shop I used to hang around with say, you know, you want to tie some flies for me, right? It's a great way to get equipment. Oh, yeah. um, it's not a great way to make money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I tied commercially. And I, my niche is I wasn't thinking out the market too well. I figured I'd tie dry flies. Yep. Right? Like your traditional Catskill style, your sure. Adams, your Kills, and those kind of things. Um, you know, they yeah. weren't the best business decision because yeah, they... <laughs> hackles kind of price. Yeah. You know, to get the good stuff, you tried tying with lesser grade hackles or, you know, non-genetics. And yeah, you could tie a dry fly with it, but you're so frustrated with the materials. They were too short. They weren't consistent. Uh, all those kind of things. But one thing about tying dry flies is you learn to tie proportions, right? Because if you don't, mm -hmm. they don't float properly. They dip mm -hmm. on their face or all these things. So that certainly helped. Yeah. Um, and just being using little tricks, I, you know, particularly when I apply thread, you know, to avoid crowding the head, I always leave at least an eye, the uh, portion of the shank equal to the length of the hook eye bare, mm -hmm. right? So I don't start my thread right at the hook eye. I leave a little bit bare. Um, when I'm securing materials up and down like ribs, I may only secure the rib uh, halfway, you know, started at the midpoint of the shank and secure it down to the bend. So again, I've put little proportional goal posts in place right right so i know mm -hmm. when i'm winding my body i get to that um rib where i tied it in i know i need to be thinking about stopping so mm -hmm. i don't crowd it right uh, and it's just practice practice yeah. practice yeah. and really at the end of the day too i just put up a post on my instagram account uh where i had a you know, a, a, a natural chronomid pupa and I had four flies distributed around it. And the comment was, no matter how hard we try, our flies are never really that close, right? And it's yeah. good fish have a pretty wide acceptance range because, um, you know, we do spend a lot of 
effort trying to tie as realistically as we can. But from a human perspective, the difference between a natural uh, insect and your flies that you use to imitate them is like night and day. But yeah. thank, thankfully they eat them, right? And I think yeah. sometimes their fish is curious or or um you know an optimist right they, they wake up every day knowing they have to eat right they're not like humans they're like geez if i eat that it's gonna add five <laughs> pounds yeah. you know, these pants aren't gonna fit right. you know looking you know every time you pick something up you're like you <laughs> everybody's <laughs> criticizing you because you're getting too big so uh whereas trout are they're all about they're not on weight watchers they're no. on weight eaters, so it's all about eating yeah for sure for sure um uh i guess kind of thinking back more to uh, getting back to your your kind of your history and people that influenced you. Is there anybody that sticks out as far as kind of, I know you mentioned a few people here already, but uh, mentors or somebody that's really helped you get to where you're at anywhere along your career? You know, I've been a sponge. So anybody that wrote a book is a mentor Mm -hmm. because I read everything. I'm just sitting here in my office looking at all the books I have. You know, some I have to admit I haven't had a chance to read yet. Yeah. They've got pictures in them, I joke. So, (laughs) Um, you know, in British Columbia, there was a book called The Gilly that came out and it was put together uh the bc federation of fly fishers put it together and it was just a compilation of different authors on still primarily still water fly fishing Mm -hmm. um so there's lots of great information in there you know one of the people i never had the chance to meet him but certainly is influenced by him was a gentleman by the name of jack shaw and he also had a big influence on brian chan brian was Mm -hmm. lucky to you know brian as well has been a mentor right Mm -hmm. um he he was sort of a a pioneering fly fisher in the Kamloops area, you know, a child of the Depression, and started to um, look at what foods were inside trout and, and start taking a closer look at um, fly fishing lakes from that perspective, you know, tying things to that looked that better looked like the food trout ate because most of the flies back then, excuse me, were the sort of the traditional loudish wet flies and those kind of things, more of yeah. an attractor. And uh, ironically, when he started tying those flies and putting them out for sale, they weren't very much accepted because it was such a breakaway. But uh, he had a huge influence on the British Columbia and perhaps Pacific Northwest um, fly scene um, mm-hmm. as well. So him, Gary Borger has been a big influence. Okay, uh, I like, you know, Gary's approach to um, um, problem solving you know, matching the hatch and just mm-hmm. presentation problems. You know, I'm, th- I'm looking at two of his books here, Designing Flies and Presentation. Um, you know, and I see Gary a lot now uh, through, you know, bump into each other all the time at fly fishing shows. So big influence by his approach. He's a great speaker too. He's, mm. you know, <laughs> as a speaker, you're like, he's a mentor in that regard, yeah. right? And, yeah, for sure. You know, to get your message across in a way that everybody's still awake at the end of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> or not throwing anything. Right. Uh, so, um, but lots, like I said, anybody that's written a book, I'm sort of you yeah. know, looking at the titles here, Doug Swisher, Gary LaFontaine, uh-huh. um, lots of them. Yeah, you know, and, and books that aren't always considered a still water source. I spent a lot of time looking at Spring Creek patterns, for example, because the, pre- the, the fly challenges are very similar, right? Yeah. I find, or the look of the flies is, you know, so uh, lots of, lots of influences. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's interesting how it's. Kind of thinking, you know, as a lot of the stuff I'm doing is is online and, you know, there's obviously a lot of, you know, work being published online as well. But it seems like there's definitely still a lack of information out there. You know, I mean, it seems like the bulk of it's still in books and maybe I just haven't dug around enough yet. Well, it's I use I'm I'm you know, I looked at computers and online as, you know, some people look at it as the end of the world as we know it. Um, (laughs) Whereas I sort of, you know, in my business life back then, I, when the first computer was put on my desk and I looked at it and, and that was when computers were like massive. Right. Um, I went, I better get my head around this thing and, and, and get comfortable with it because it's not going anywhere. In fact, it's only going to get worse. And now if you didn't have a smartphone or a computer, you'd be, you're crippled, right? I spend a lot of time on YouTube. I like, I have my own YouTube channel, right? So I'm a big, um, you know, I, I envy that that's around nowadays because I remember the first fly tying books were sketch drawings, right? So it was kind of hard to even see. And then black and white pictures were better, but not, and now color. And now you've got video and now you can stop it back up, zoom in, yep. do all kinds of things, right? That you just didn't have the, the opportunity to do in the past. Yeah. So that's had, had a big influence. But a, b- books are still, it's funny, of all the things man has created, books still 
stand the test of time. I remember seeing something on the news the other night that they're <clears> coming <throat> back and not in the <laughs> in the younger generation, not the generation you would expect it for, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. books still have their place. I still like a good book. I still yep. haven't quite got into the whole, I have an iPad and stroke, you know, yeah. minimizing and maximizing and swiping and it's, um, it's yep. okay on a plane, but, uh, it's, you not, know, the it's same. not something I can cuddle up around the fire no. or, or in my office and sort of, uh, do the whole scrolling thing sort of takes away from turning pages somehow. Maybe yeah. I'm an old yeah, old no, I, I, I agree. I think, I think, yeah, books are definitely not going away there. There's, it's like the resource, you know, you grab a good yep. book and you want to look at flies. I mean, YouTube, there's no question. I mean, especially fly tying. I mean, that's, that's a game changer because of what you said, being able to stop and pause and stuff like that. But just search, you know, and search. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's every, I mean, it, well, I guess everything's not out there, but I mean, it seems like almost every fly that's ever been yep. tied is, is out there on YouTube. Um, but yeah, the audio thing is the, the other, I'm not, I'm not into the, you know, the Kindle stuff either, but, um, but gosh, when it comes to audio, I'm, I'm definitely, I and mean, that's part of the reason yep. this whole podcast thing idea kind of came for me is that I've kind of, you know, been into podcasts and just audio versions of stuff for quite a while. So I love the, I love he- doing the, you know, hearing the stories and hearing about people and, you know, that's kind of what has been one of the awesome things about doing this is just kind of hearing well, this. I like them too when you travel you know when you, yeah. I drive a lot along you know where I live in Alberta um, I'm pretty central I can be in um, West Yellowstone in 13 hours I can mm-hmm. be in Kamloops area in 10 I can mm-hmm. do be out to Manitoba I do a lot of still water trips out there in 10 <clears> but <throat> it's just driving right and I like I'm yeah. not, you know, a long drive doesn't, I kind of like it. It's alone time. It's time to think and yep. come up with new crazy ideas. Um, but podcasts are great to just pass the time, right? Because a lot of those areas, you don't have the best radio reception. There's only so many times you can go through your mix on iTunes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, I heard that um, 12 times. So yeah, yeah podcasts are great for that. Yeah, good, good stuff. Um, so uh, as far as we talked definitely a little about, uh, you know, uh, patterns and things like that, are there any... Have we talked about your, if you had to say your three go-to patterns for, for lakes or. That's so hard. Yeah. man. Because, and the reason I say that it's not to be evasive or secretive. It's, I I was down at uh, Kelly Gallup's one time doing, um, he had an event down there and this one guy was just, what fly? If you had only one fly, only one fly. And I couldn't, you know, give him an answer because I don't really make any decisions until I get to the lake shore. And, you know, I certainly, um, I fish a lot of leech patterns, particularly balanced leeches. And in the spring, I fish a lot of coronamids because they're just out all the time. And trout eat mm-hmm. so many of those over the course of the season. It's almost a Pavlovian instinctive response. You can catch fish on coronamids even when they're not even feeding on them, right? Mm. They'll just, it's like a jelly bean. They know what one is and they'll eat it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, during hatch times, you know, I like fishing damsels and mayflies. So, you know, sometimes my pattern selection is governed by where I go. Um, like for dry fly fishing, I love going down and fishing the lakes around the West Yellowstone area, Hebgen and Quake, um, mm-hmm. because they're so known for their calabatus hatches in August, which is traditionally not a uh, still water month because most of the lower level lakes are pretty warm and yep. it's just not the thing to do so you're doing other things so um doing that i love like i say i love fishing damsels and calabatus um leeches I even like fishing scuds and things it seasonally things change as well there's so many food sources in lakes there are you know chronomids mayflies um caddis uh damsels dragons two families of dragons hmm. uh leeches scuds zooplankton that yeah. was fun well, microspec so there's attractor techniques we use there's just so many different um different things different choices to do that it's hard to narrow it down to one yeah that um, is. you know i probably start with a balanced leech of some sort to start with um it's a fly you can cover water with you know if you look at a tournament bass angler they fish those reaction baits to catch a fish, find out where they are, and then build their pattern from there. Okay. Uh, similar logic, you know, you're trying to catch a fish. I, I do use the throat pump, not on every fish, but the first guy usually gets it um, mm-hmm. to find out what's going on and then tailor your approach to there. So I like to keep my options open and, and more of a, despite all being known for fly tying and books and DVDs and YouTube and all that stuff, I'm more presentation Trump's pattern every time. Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. You, know, yep, you for sure. make it, you make it behave and look appealing to a fish. Mm-hmm. 
uh, for the conditions you're faced with, you'll probably be successful, right? Yeah, and still, you think size more important than color on lakes, or? Yeah, I use four things with flies: size, shape, color, and behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, probably size, shape, and these are all important: behavior and then color, because mm-hmm. color is so subjective depending on suspended matter, depth, yeah. light levels, um, so many, de- and of course water has an effect on color the deeper you go anyway it, you know it nullifies a lot of colors uh is it the high the reds oranges and yellows first right down to your purples blues purples and blacks um that's what you know behavior and still water patterns is twofold for me it's how you animate the fly with your retrieve and the choice of materials so we use a lot of soft mobile things that just come to life just mm. with the subtle currents that are down there mm-hmm. your boots, your rabbits dubbing mixes that'll you know ebb and flow with the water so it looks alive mm-hmm. you know, those kind of things yeah mm-hmm. nice nice um and on as far as hatches and thinking about it, you mentioned this at, at the beginning but just lakes from um streams you know the difference there yeah. what are is it just this sheer number of bugs I, what do you think is the biggest difference between um there's just a lot of different choices on lakes um and there's there's food sources that are fall in the hatch category that, you know, start their life in water and end it, you know, transition and hatch uh, into the, into our atmosphere. Um, and then there's those bread and butter staple food sources that are around year round. So on a hatch chart on lakes, no matter where you go, regardless of latitude or elevation, um, you know, those things will have a, a deceleration on the process or an acceleration um, as far, you know, like things that are hatches, occur at higher elevations later right mm-hmm. or lower latitudes things are hatching uh further because just things get warmer right yep. um so from the hatch perspective you've got your chironomids are the first major hatch that you know as soon as the ice comes off they're if they're lake subject to ice off they're going to go get going um and then you've got your mayflies next in sequence often overlapped to some degree by damselflies then your caddis and then your dragonflies come off. And in the fall, you'll have mating and migration flights. And again, re- early spring, right after ice off of water boatmen and back swimmers. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of your hatches yeah. you focus on. And then you've got the bread and butter or the staples, as I call them, those things that are around all the time um, when there's nothing else to focus them on, on the hatch. So that's things like freshwater shrimp or scuds, mm-hmm. leeches, uh, bait fish, Crayfish, if they're present to uh, some degree, snails, always fun. Um, and again, I talked about zooplankton as well at times, particularly in deeper water. Yeah, nice. Nice. Uh, what is, if you had, you, you're going to go fish and you had your one, one place to go to, your one uh, river, stream, lake, whatever, do you have Do you have some spot that's kind of your, your go-to oh. place? Wow. That's tough too. Or may, it maybe so maybe it doesn't a, have to be a specific lake, uh, lake, but just a type of fishing. I or... like the West Yellowstone region. Yeah, I just, you know, very pleasing on the eyes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just, it is nice. Know, trout have this habit. And most fish have the habit of not li- living in ugly places. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's uh, one aspect of it. Um, um, I like the and, you know, ironically for that area that gets such pressure. Um, the Madison and all the rivers of the Yellowstone Park and all that, the lakes are not all that pressured as compared to the, you know, the Henry's Lake can get pretty busy at times. But uh, yeah. so I like that. I like the lakes of British Columbia around the Kamloops region mm-hmm. um, and up towards uh, 100 Mile House area, north of Kamloops, northwest of Kamloops. Um, so lakes those... like Sheridan. Yeah. I like crystal clear lakes. Okay. I find them very, very challenging. Uh, I like being able to see the bottom and see fish, and those keeps you busy when nothing's going on. Yeah, and a similar depth in a in a twenty foot or less sort of depth. Yeah, just yeah. Uh, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And there's some, you know, there's lakes that uh, I used to take my family, my two sons when they were young, and take them all the time around the Kamloops area, Tonquin. And late in the middle of August when they were off school, we used to have. There still is coronamids that come off that lake that are um, huge. Like we're fishing ten and eight two X long hooks Jeez. for the people. Like they're monstrous. I huh. I know some some of my friends down in California were a size 14, 16 chronomid pupas, sort of standard fare. They open up the box and see one of those big bombers, and they're like, "What the <laughs> heck are those for?" Right? Yeah. And uh, although they are getting popular on um, um, lakes like uh, Pyramid for the big oh, big oh, cutthroat yeah. 
Yep. So um, yeah, they're popular too. Did like Argentina? Got to admit, I liked uh, uh-huh. fishing Jurassic Lake. To that's sort of the World Series of stillwater trout as far as size goes. Huh. Right, like they are. There's something about catching a 16 pound fish in four Jeez. feet of water. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> kind of a kind of addictive. Yeah, um, wow. It's hard it's hard to pick favorites. Right? Yeah, it is. And it... one of the things I like to do is do stuff. I talked about it with walleye is chase other things. Like I, my, my, one of my models, if it swims and eats, I'm interested. Right. So I, I like chasing smallmouth bass on the fly. I yeah. think they're a blast. Um, panfish as well. I fish chronomet techniques for crappie and sunfish down in Oregon. I had a uh-huh. blast doing that. Um, you know, keep your options open. Yeah, you know, I think sure. sometimes if you try to railroad your pigeonhole yourself or just say, that's all I'm going to do, I think you're missing out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, for and for bass fishing, you, you do kind of use typical bass type of flies or are you just using the same? Well, I find smallmouth have a, they have trout-like qual- uh, mm-hmm. qualities, right? So they like leeches and minnows and, you know, it's certain they are definitely more willing to come up through eight feet of water and smash a popper on the surface, which... Yeah. I'm totally okay. Uh, <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I, it's, uh, I've got a, a couple of good friends down in California that fish and use some of my dragonfly nymph patterns in the, in the Delta and say they're really effective bass flies. Right. And mm-hmm. it makes sense. Look at the environment a bass lives in. It's the same kind of jungle that a, a dragonfly nymph would like to stalk through and hunt as well. So yeah. they're going to run into each other from time to time. And I can't think it goes well for the dragonfly nymph. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> He's a pretty capable predator and gets to a pretty appreciable size in the bug world. He's yeah. nothing to a large. He's just a quick inhale and move on to the next thing. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, dragonflies are amazing. Uh, so we're, uh, yeah, we're kind of getting here close here, uh, Phil wrapping things up. I got a few more questions for you. Sure. Um, so think about, you know, maybe the next six months or so, do you have anything kind of exciting, anything new coming up that we can uh, expect to keep our eyes on for you or anything that's just kind of getting you, getting you going? Yeah. Like I said, I mentioned the Stillwater app. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. We're doing that. Brian Chan and I Stillwater, uh, app. There's a Stillwater, oh, I should know this off the top of my head but we have a facebook um page you can keep track okay. on what now what can you explain a little bit about the, what the app is it's basically uh mm-hmm. you know help people still waters it's a it'll be an app that's um i believe the app developer is going to make it like a monthly subscription kind of app but mm-hmm. what's unique is it's constantly updating um it does not need wi-fi other than the initial downloads mm-hmm. to work so you can be out in the middle of nowhere run across a problem and hopefully we've put a tip in there, a video tip on how to deal with it. So mm. we've got chapters on choosing, you know, on flies, helping you choose patterns and some tying videos as well. Um, we've got entomology. So you see a bug, what's it do? What, you know, how's it behave? Mm-hmm. Um, equipment, you know, uh, considerations from boats to reels to rods. Um, and of course, techniques and tactics, which is by far the largest chapter on all kinds of things to do hmm. with still fly fishing from wow. retrieves to how to fish a point, how to work drop-offs, all of those kind of things um, hmm. as well. So we're looking, it's taken a little longer than we thought. Um, I don't know if you do any uh, filming um, yeah, yourself. A bit. Yeah. It's, a lot of trial and a lot of error. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I know it is, yeah. You know, everything that can mm-hmm. will go wrong. Uh, you know, and I've filmed a, a lot of television over the years, but mm. it's just, it's just whenever you, like anything you're trying to do, it seems the whole world's against you at that moment. Um, so doing that, um, heading into my show season, so a lot of um, speaking at... Um, uh, the fly fishing show circuit. So summer, I'll be not Somerset anymore. It's Edison, New Jersey, um, Denver, uh, mm-hmm. Linwood, Seattle, Pleasanton, nice. Wasatch tying expo. Brian and I'll be down there. Um, Boise Valley fly fishers set, um, pretty well takes us up, um, and a few Canadian based shows in Vancouver, those mm-hmm. kind of things takes you up till the start of the season. Mm-hmm. And then from there, it's sort of on the water schools. So mm-hmm. uh, Brian Chan and I are doing an advanced stillwater fly fishing school at Stony Lake Lodge and um, just south of between Kamloops and Merritt, British Columbia. It's a private fishery, um, boats, accommodation. It's, it's pretty comfy. It's mm-hmm. a nice way to learn how to fish. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're doing another one just up the road in late April. Um, actually, the one in the, that advanced school is in June. Uh, Roche Lake Resort. Brian and I are doing a little um, event there. Um, 
the last weekend in April. Uh, that's public water just south of Kamloops. Great, great fishery. Um, and then I do hosted trips to Manitoba uh, each year. Uh, Southwest Manitoba has got some lakes they've specifically groomed for stillwater trout fishing. Browns, rainbows, big tigers. Hmm. Um, you know, you got diversity of fish, large average fish size, and remoteness. Uh, a lot of these, that area is not close to anything, so you don't get a lot of pressure that you see on more, you know, lakes that are closer to, you know, big cities. Um, so I do two uh, spring trips there that are primarily chronomid focused at that time and a fall trip. So we do that for accommodation, food, everything, um, six full days on the water. Everybody gets through my boat at least once mm. uh, to fish with me. Are uh, these mostly all... people that are pretty experienced, just not with no. lakes or just all around? Uh, a, a real cross-section. We've yeah. had some people that are you know, very experienced and uh, just come for the great still water fishing, and it's a great classroom to teach because, for example, with the chironomid, uh, style focused clinics we do I do in the first two weeks of June or the last week of May first week of June um, you can do a div you know besides strike indicators we can do a whole pile of other presentation techniques so you can see that it's not just a strike indicator show anymore it's lots of other things the way we used to fish chronomids prior to strike indicators that mm -hmm. are still deadly effective and just fun to do and it's always like i said earlier the more you know the better you end so don't get yourself pigeonholed into one present don't be a one trick right. pony no um, one of my morals um so doing all that um and that pretty well takes me right up until you know august is tends to be more personal time and and now with the app going and, and keep feeding that there'll be lots of filming and stuff all the time going on with oh, that yeah. so, oh, so and so, so there's growing the youtube channel oh yeah yeah, what's your what's your YouTube? Uh, the YouTube channels you kind of started out to see if um, people actually care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so right now I'm just over I want to say 3,600 subscribers or so. Nice. Uh, um, predominantly um, fly fishing. Uh, sorry, fly tying. Fly fishing. Of course, it's fly fishing. Yeah. Um, predominantly fly tying. But I'm going to start expanding into uh, that'll help support the app and, and how the flies and do some kind of vlog style um, mm -hmm. uh, filming uh, this coming season because I, I enjoy YouTube and, and it's a great platform for people to interact and learn um, mm -hmm. through well. So have some fun with that as well. So, nice. um, yeah, lots. I've always got my brain's always going. That's the danger or the fun of long drives. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of I'm the same yeah, way. I, I I drive a lot too. And, uh, you mentioned uh, Kelly uh, Kelly Gallup uh, Gallup yeah. a, little, a bit ago. I, I chatted with him. He's he's hopefully going to be on the show soon as well. So it'll be great to get. It's get, a character. He's yeah, a character. yeah, yeah. He he kind of knows a, a friend of mine through a, another deal. But uh, yeah, so this this is going to be good to kind of make connect some of the dots and and go from there. Um, so yeah, Phil, I think we're about there. I had one more question I like to throw out occasionally when when it seems right. Do you have, and maybe you don't have one of these, but do you have a good uh, crazy fly fishing story that uh, you want to throw out to uh, to everybody here? Well, there's usually lots. Usually it involves me doing something stupid. <laughs> um, you know that moment. Hope nobody saw that. That's like, right. Oh yeah, we saw. It's like caught it on. No, they'll catch it on video now. <laughs> you know, I remember one, and it's it's more about my two sons. Who everybody asked me if my sons like fly fishing. I always joke. Well, they didn't really have much of a choice. Yeah. Um, but my oldest, Brandon, he's 25 now. But when he was a little, you know, he was just fishing, and he was um. You know, a lot of times you put kids in a boat and you're back in 10 minutes, right? It's yep. <laughs> it's not about fishing. Oh, yeah. It's about just driving kids around. Yep. But he took to it like a duck to water. Huh. And um, he was, um, you know, there was, he could, have, he could do anything he wanted in the boat as long as he didn't fall out, right? So snacks yep. were on, bring your toys, whatever. Sure. And, um, you know, we were still in my small pram at the time. We'd sit side by side and he was fishing a chronomid under an indicator and he was constantly, you know, your indicator's under. No, it's not. You know, you always tell me it's under. Well, one time he said, dad, my indicator's under. And I looked up, you know, with that kind of parent, yeah, sure it is. Yep. And then, oh my God, it's under, right? So, so nice. he sets the hook and he lands his fish and it's a couple pounds huh. and he's elated, right? And he wants to, you know, kill it and yep. take it back to mom so that's fine you know um i'm not against bonking the odd fish i don't sure. particularly like fish i don't like all the bones oh, yeah. i like fish and chips um <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i don't know if that quite qualifies yeah. but anyway so you know being a catch and release guy i'm looking around the boat i've got nothing to really 
killed his fish with, hmm. right? So a friend of mine comes over. His son's a couple years over, older, and he's got this old axe handle. He puts some lead <laughs> up in the handle. So his son throws it across, you know, not, you know, throw from outfield, but, you know, yeah. eight, ten feet away. My son doesn't quite get things coordinated. It hits him square between the eyes. Oh, right? Jesus. Staggers him for a second, but he's so excited that, uh, you know, doesn't phase him. Um, and uh, let's go show mom. So we go roaring back in, well, roaring as much as you can with electric. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, the boat's just starting to come into the landing, you know, into the shore to land, and he, he flies off. He must have cleared six feet of water, I think. Holding his <laughs> fish, probably. My wife goes, what the hell did you do to him? Because by that point, his yeah. forehead had come up like a unicorn. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, man, mom's pissed. She's she's okay with it. You know, once you explain it, right, it was pretty funny. But, yeah, uh, yeah that's probably one of the <laughs> nice. memorable. Got, that, yeah. I got a, I've got a couple of young kids, three and five years old, so it's uh, – I'm excited to get to that. I mean, I'm kind of already starting to try to get to that point. Any uh, any tips from a, as a father to, you know, kind of have your kids get into it as opposed to uh, – I've heard patience. of the stories, the, the uh, patience. Patience, no high expectations. You know, there's – my uh, youngest son, Sean, he's now 22, 23 coming up. He didn't take to it quite as well, but eventually the – you know, he, he thought it was fun, so there was a lot more – you know, get out there. I want to go in, get in. I want to go out. You know, you're like a human yo-yo. You just, when you, when you had the kids along for a trip, it wasn't a fishing trip that you were used to when you go out with the boys or by yeah. yourself, the, the gang or whatever. Um, you know, and, um, you know, let them, you know, be with them and teach them. And it's fun. It's just part of being a parent. You know, I took Brandon to a little lake that if a fish got 10 inches long, um, that was a major fish, but you threw anything that landed on the surface. It was like feeding goldfish or mm -hmm. piranhas <laughs> and catching, um, nice. you know, that's because he would be picking up, laying down, picking up, laying down all the time. And all of a sudden within about four hours, he can cast. Huh. Yeah. Now he's cut, you know, because kids are so they're in that learning mode. They have no bias. Mm -hmm. Um, they, you know, uh, arguably the worst students are middle-aged men. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because um, they can horsepower something through, right? They can right. just put enough energy behind it. It'll go even though well, it's not quite the right technique. But, yes, it went out 45 feet. So, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, um, yeah being patient, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, lots of snacks in the boat. <laughs> yep, yep. No, it's sure, they go to the washroom before they get in the boat because I like to pull that when they're bored. Oh, yeah. I got to go to the – no, you don't. You just went <laughs> – yeah. Um, yeah, don't take them on trophy hunts. <laughs> yeah, you know? don't take them out in the freezing cold for too long. You know, so some, you know, each kid's different. Like I say, my oldest, I sat through a one day of just r rainstorm after rainstorm. He had the, you know, he's got rain jacket and everything. He just sat there and took it all in. No kidding. You know, wow. I was going, I'm not, ha this isn't fun anymore, right? Yeah. <laughs> going in. Um, but yeah, patience and, and just adapt. Each kid's different. Yeah, right? you you have with your children one that's just all over this and can't get enough of it and it's dragging you out of bed at four in the morning to go almost like it's Christmas Day and the other one it's like yeah come on let's totally. go you know they're gonna have fun and there's those days that they just they don't want to do it they don't want to do it yeah right now yep, my sure. two whine and bitch at me because I don't take them fishing enough I'm nice. always off somewhere else doing something yeah yeah so they're so they're still into it. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, my oldest was really giving me the gears this past summer. You know, I did a couple. I did a fly, a great fly and pike destination to check out a lodge, Arctic lodges in Saskatchewan, possibly do some schools there for huge pike. And we were getting, we were pulling lake trout up. They were in hundred feet of water, and we were figured Jeez. out how to get them on a fly. So, Holy cow! Uh, yeah, a lot of the conventional guys were like, "You got them on a fly," and when we just managed to figure out you know, the the way it was working, the drift was so slow one day that we could cast out with fast sinking lines and control the boat because there's no way you can anchor in a hundred feet, but hmm. control it so the fly line could sink. Mm -hmm. And once you got it down, the, the common way with conventional gear is to jig for them, but a fly rod doesn't jig very well because it absorbs the jigging action. Hmm. So once you got it down, then you just start aggressive two to two two and a half foot strips, hmm. and they they just clobbered the fly. Right? Wow. <laughs> you That's know, the lodge awesome. record 60 pounds. So I think we got in the 20s as big as we got. But um, but uh, my son was giving me the gears. How come he didn't get to go? Yeah. Because I took my wife because she was filming. We were doing some filming while we were there too for the lodge. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's... Uh, 
That's awesome. And she's become my camera person. Yeah, that's the, <laughs> I guess that's the bonus of being, uh, you know, doing what you do. It's like, you know, it's part of, uh, part of work, right? You, you have to do it. But he's the such that it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Nice. All right, Phil. Well, uh, did I uh, miss anything here? Anything else you want to add as far as, I mean, we no. talked a lot about lake fishing and any other tidbits? No, just get out there and do it all. <laughs> all right. Sounds awesome. Yeah. Uh, do you, uh, maybe want to sh- give a shout out to where people can find you again, if they want to get sure. in touch with you? Uh, definitely. Um, email flycraft at shaw.ca. I have my own website, flycraftangling.com. Uh, you can contact me through there. We have the Stillwater Fly Fishing Store, the online store Brian and I have set up. That's stillwaterflyfishingstore.com. Apparently that was good for search engines. So yeah. I trusted our guy. Oh, there you go. Um, and YouTube. Uh, yep. Just Phil Roll or Philip Rowley fly fishing search will get you. Um, social media to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter to some degree, um, and then I think that's about yeah. it. And then when the app comes out, that'll be everywhere. But those are the best ways because okay. I'm always and it's Phil Rowley fly fishing. I had the Philip Rowley personal page that yeah. got to 5,000 and you're cut off. Um, so now I have a profile page and that's where I spend most of my time now. I uh, periodically take a peek at my personal page, but uh, yeah. everything's on the Phil Rowley fly fishing page. Um, okay. And it's Flycraft Phil for Twitter and Instagram. Okay. One's capitalized. The other can't never remember which one. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll get links to all this and put it in the yeah. show notes and make sure everybody has a chance to, you know, when they connect with me, I'll direct them your way. Um, and yeah, we can go from there. Uh, wanted to say uh, thanks for coming on, Phil. I really appreciate it. This has been a I mean, way more packed than I thought as far as the, uh, the the stuff you went into. A lot of stuff I haven't even, uh, you know, hadn't even heard of, you know, as far as lakes. Back. Yeah. I told you you wouldn't be able to shut me up. No, it's been, it's been <laughs> awesome. I, yeah, we could definitely uh, talk more, and I'll, I'll have you back here when I get some, uh, some more big questions for you. So, yeah, thanks again, Phil, and we'll uh, talk to you soon. All right, Dave. Take care. All right, see ya. Bye. So there you have it. If you want to find Phil, go to flycraftangling.com. And if you want to find the show notes for this episode, just go to wetflyswing.com and search for Phil Rowley. Thanks again for checking out the show today, and I'll look forward to talking with you soon or maybe even seeing you on the river. I'll catch up with you soon and see you on the flip side.